continue on in the bulletin and we'll join together our call to worship from Psalm 80. <coughs> Shepherd of Israel, listen to us. You lead your people like sheep. You sit on your throne above the cherub angels. Let us see you. Shepherd of Israel, show your greatness to all the world. Come and save your people. God, accept us again. Smile down on us and save us. Let's join together in hymn number 37. Immortal, invisible, God only wise. Bibles, 
That is on page 1892. First Peter 5, starting with verse 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him, because he cares for you. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you in his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's take a moment in our worship service this morning to share our joys and concerns, our spiritual needs. This is just a reminder that during the congregation's sharing of joys and concerns, we'll be turning the sanctuary microphone off to protect the privacy of those in the meeting house. As always, if you have something about which you'd like to have others join you in prayer, you could contact Pastor Ed or pretty much anyone connected with the church, and we'll put you on the prayer chain and lift your concerns to the Lord. In the meantime, please join us in an attitude of prayer, and we'll have a few moments of silence before we turn the sound back up and join together in the Lord's Prayer. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gather us into your presence, God of peace. We come today remembering that even in the darkest of days, your flame of hope and new life flickers, drawing us on to find the good and to illuminate the world with your gospel of love. When we search hard for you, we may miss your presence in the everyday. So help us to look out for you in the face of friend and of stranger. <clears throat> mm. 
all too often we grasp after our prosperity and our safety building walls of self-sufficiency and storing up great resources in the barns of our nation, finding the other and difference to be a threat to us. God of all, your ways are of mercy. Your heart is for reconciliation. So help us to accept the hand of forgiveness that you offer. Help us to leave behind what has weighed us down, to seek the ways of friendship and peace, and to trust that you want the best for us. Hear us now as we offer our prayers of thanksgiving for all the good in our lives. In light of upcoming Veterans Day, we hold with gratitude the service of those who are peacemakers in the service of our country. We pray for the dedicated services of our armed forces in all the generations. In Scripture, your faithful people wrote their responses to the movement of your spirit. We pray, too, for your spirit to be recognized among all our leaders, praying for tenacity, energy, and an open-eyed, open-hearted vision for our communities in the world. God of the cross and of the empty tomb, God of the road to Emmaus and the breakfast on the shore, you have shown us in Jesus the way that is beyond death. So hold us in the faith of your future. Help us to rest in the confidence of new light and life, to trust that those we have loved and lost have returned to you, and that our own walk is the way home, where you wait for us in the mystery of eternal life. May our prayers rise to you like incense, God our Maker, our Savior and Sustainer, through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father. standing with me and join in our uh, next hymn, All Things Are Yours, hymn number 447 in our red hymnal. Now let's ask the Holy Spirit to come and move among us this morning. Um, I am going to uh, just forget the technical stuff and ask God to take over. <laughs> so let's do that. 
Holy Spirit, you are the one who indwells us, who who breathes God, the life of God into us and transforms us from death to life. So we pray that you would do that this morning, that you would breathe into us new life, that we would be able to <gasps> inhale what you have for us. <clears throat> Fill us, teach us and guide us. Lord God, help us to look to you, to be shaped, to become more like Jesus. And if there's anything that is, that's just merely human of us that's left, Lord, just like a master sculptor with a chisel, just chip that bit away so that only Jesus remains among us. And so may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So I, I didn't mention this during the shares of our joys and concerns. Um, joy, we got the bathroom floor done. We actually have tile and it's in a grid pattern and it's mostly level. I'm pretty pleased, honestly. I, I was a little concerned, and I knew it was going to be challenging, and I knew that there were going to be some unexpected truths I was going to learn in that process. And and I have to say, perhaps my activities have been shading, influencing my sermon process. But perhaps the opposite is true. Perhaps my scripture reading has shaped how I'm viewing my current situation. So let's take a look. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Amos, we will finish the book this morning. Amos chapter 9, and we'll pick this up at verse 8, and we're going to go through the end of the chapter, so that actually goes through verse 15. Amos 9, verses 8 through 15. God is restoring his nation, the nation of Israel, here in the text. That's what we're dealing with this morning. And there are certain things that he has to do to accomplish that. So, the first one, the first thing that God has to do is demolition. Is to tear down sinful structures that shatter. Demolition. Tear down sinful structures that shatter. Let's look at verses 8, 9, and 10 of Amos verse, chapter 9. Verse 8, Surely the eyes of the Sovereign Lord are on the sinful kingdom. I will destroy it from the face of the earth. Yet I will not totally destroy the house of Jacob, declares the Lord. For I will give the command, and I will shake the house of Israel among the nations, as grain is shaken in a sieve, and not a pebble will reach the ground. All the sinners among my people will die by the sword. All those who say disaster will not overtake or meet us. Now, I've mentioned this again, uh, or I've mentioned this before. I will mention it again. This sermon, this idea was picked out last October. I had no idea, so I don't want you to think, well, boy, that Pastor Ed's getting awfully political. Well, I'm going to say, yes, I am getting awfully political, but the nation I'm getting political about is Israel just so we're clear, okay? I, I don't, <laughs> and I know I'm not broadcasting today, but I, I really don't want secret service agents to show up and say, you're like, no, 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 this is, this is an old nation. Let's deal with the truths that we find God dealing with them. Demolition, sinful structures will shatter. They can't possibly last. And when we look at verse 8 and it talks about the sinful kingdom, this is specifically Israel, but not only Israel. Um, when we go back and we look at the earlier chapters, Amos also brought uh, Tyre and Sidon and Phoenicia to task. It wasn't just Judah and Israel who were in trouble. Because sin is going to be wiped out. There is going to come a day, no more sin. Maranatha, come quickly, Lord, right? I, I am so ready for that day to come. 
But in the meantime, while we are still here, let's be patient. Because sin will be wiped out, but not all people will be wiped out. Structures are going to be dismantled and shattered, but people not necessarily. And I find that to be a word of truth. The problems are going to be dealt with, but the people will remain. Verses 9 and 10. Israel's judgment as a demonstration of God's power and justice. I'm going to shake the house of Israel among the nations. Now, I don't know if you've ever done this. Um, have any of you ever gone gold panning? Anyone? Okay. A couple. So, when I was a kid, my parents took me to Southern California and we got to do gold panning. And, and what you would do is you'd kneel down at the stream and you'd scoop up a bunch of mud. And you would shake the pan full of mud and water. And gold being heavier than everything else in mud would kind of sink to the bottom. It would, it would separate. And you, you'd kind of brush the mud out of the way. Now, this is a remembrance of an eight-year-old. that probably wasn't really good at it. But it's still a very clear picture. And you'd hopefully find little shiny nuggets that you'd find gold. Of course, when I was doing this, it was, I think, 1973, the gold rush had kind of moved on. So I didn't find a whole lot of anything. And I got very, very excited when I find shiny bits. And then they tell me, oh, that's fool's gold. And, and quite frankly, I said, I don't care. It has the word gold in it. I'm keeping it. I worked too hard for this. You see, God is going to shake the nations. And the gold, his people, are going to remain. The dross, the mud, is going to get brushed away. It's going to get swept downstream. But God isn't going to do that to his children. We will experience judgment going on around us. And frankly, we might get hit with a bit of mud as it's happening. But it's not targeted at us. I think that's the takeaway lesson we get from how God dealt with Israel. Let's look at the next point here. The second thing that God has to do. Not only does he have to do demolition, but he's got to do renovation. There's a kingdom connection going on here. Re renovation, renovation, the kingdom connection, is found in verses 11 and 12. Verse 11, in that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. I will repair its broken places, restore its ruins, and build it up as it used to be, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the nations that bear my name, declares the Lord, who will do these things. So for us to, to really wrap our heads around this, we've got to remember that there are 12 tribes in the Jewish family, right? And... Over time, there was a split that happened, and Judah and Levi lived in the south around Jerusalem, and the other ten tribes, whose names I won't mention because I'm sure I'll forget somebody, they all went up north, and the, those ten tribes up north were called the nation of Israel. But they were all one family. Originally, they were all quite literally one family. And there was something that happened, and it split the family. And God is saying that this family is going to be restored. He's going to bring them back together. When we see here in that day, I will restore David's fallen tent. God is going to make the nation whole, he says. He's going to make Israel whole, and he did. History shows that that's what happened. They came back from Israel, and they weren't the 12 separate tribes that were warring anymore. They were one nation. Now, here's the thing. We are not ancient Jews. We live in 2020, and most of us, dare I say, all of us in here are Gentiles. We've been grafted into this family. We've been drawn in. We're included in this promise. There are promises that God makes to his nation of Israel, not to the church, the nation of Israel. And I do believe that God is going to keep all of those promises to the nation of Israel. Israel. But here's the thing. Just like we can be in the midst of judgment and get splashed with the mud, we can be in the midst of blessings and get splashed by the blessings. So frankly, I think it's to our advantage to try and find the center of God's will and stay there. 
And God is going to bless whom God is going to bless. And if I get a little bit of that, hallelujah. I'm going to look for him at work and do my best to join him there. What this is all meaning, verse 12 especially, is that God has restored David's kingdom, a promise that he made in the Old Testament, through Jesus, his descendant. Jesus, just genetically, as a, as a human, has the right to sit on David's throne. The whole God becoming man thing aside, Jesus is the fulfillment of God's promise to David. And now when you add the whole God becoming man thing and we become one in Christ, we get to share in that blessing. Even though this is specifically targeted to Israel, we, we get a little bit of it too. There's a kingdom connection that we want to hold on to. So God is restoring the nation. Demolition is first and renovation is second. And restoration is the third thing. Restoration. This is repairing and restoring that God is doing. And we've got to find that in verses 13 through 15. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the reaper will be overtaken by the plowman and the planter by the one treading grapes. New wine will drip from the mountains and flow from all the hills. I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. They will rebuild the ruined cities and live in them. They will plant the vineyards and drink their wine. They will make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant Israel in their own land, never again to be uprooted from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. God is all about restoration, about restoring people. Verse 13, God's blessings will follow. This is a promise that he gives Amos. Now, if you were to, be, to try and read this for the really critical eye, there's lots and lots and lots of resources that help you do that. And frankly, there are a bunch of commentaries who get to this section of Amos and they say, oh, well, this section of Amos was obviously written 100, 200 years after the rest of the, the, the other parts of the book of Amos because he's just so right on and he couldn't possibly know that. Uh, unless so this is a later writer and I'm going to say he's a prophet that's part of the whole you know prophet gig to hear a word of hope from the God who is outside of time and therefore isn't stuck in time like Amos the prophet is now it's not that all prophets are always just going to be truth or, or fortune tellers the point is that they're going to be truth tellers. And Amos tells the truth. Look, Israel, you as a nation, not good. You've had a, a bunch of rotten, evil kings. You as a nation are participating in sinful, awful structures. All of that's going to be torn down. But God cares for you, the individuals, in that and God will restore you, the individuals. God's blessings are going to follow. And history shows they did. Just what happens here, is mentioned here, happened. In fact, it's so kind of on the nose that I really can't bust the chops of the commentary who, like, oh, well, this is written to, this little section was written 200 years later. No, I, I don't believe that. I think. God told Amos what was going to happen, and Amos told everybody, and there's a great wind of hope that went through people. I think that's, what's the word I'm looking for? Congruent? Uh, that's too mathy. Uh, consistent, that's the word I'm looking for. That's consistent with the character we've seen from God. God will make a promise that says, okay, if you make bad choices, you're going to have bad results, but I'm still going to love you through it. That's been my life. I've made awful, dumb decisions. And yet God has loved me through it. I'm not even going to ask if anybody else has got that. Because I know every hand should shoot up and every hand won't. Because who wants to admit to that? It's painful. I get it. God restores. That's the point. Look at verses 14 and 15. There's a wonderful little thing I want to make sure we catch here. Verse 14, I will bring back my exiled people, Israel. He's not talking about the nation of Israel anymore. Now he's talking about family. 
right? I don't know about you, I have goosebumps everywhere right now. God restores family. When family seeks him, he is more than willing to put them back into play, as it were. As a kingdom, Israel was destroyed. As a people, they were restored. And now let's think about our New Testament passage for just a moment. We read verses 6 through 10. I'm just going to point you to verse 10. 1 Peter 5.10, And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. God intends for us to be with him, not away from him. The whole premise of the law, of the Old Testament law, is not to set this impossible standard that we can't possibly do. However, when we look at this impossible standard that we can't possibly do in and of ourselves because we don't have the right fuel, if we walk hand in hand with God, that's the point. The law is designed to show us that we need to be in relationship with God, our maker, as was originally intended in the Garden of Eden. We were supposed to be walking around a bunch of, um, among a bunch of fruit trees. And you're hungry, you just snatch the peach and the pomegranate and the banana and I don't know, whatever, you know, wherever your favorite fruit is. I'm assuming it's just hanging right there. And we go for walks in the evening with the Father. That was what it was supposed to be. And the good news is that is what it's going to be again. God is going to restore his people to himself. Once our sin has been dealt with, we can enjoy that restored relationship. And that is made possible through Jesus. Let's pray. Lord God, we know your, your, your scripture is just all, it's all over the place where it's very consistent that we need to live in fellowship with you. We need to walk around with you. And yet our sin separates us from you. We intentionally let go and decide that we're going to stomp off and do things our own way. And shocker of shocker, it doesn't work out. And we get mad that it doesn't work out, which makes us madder at you. But your tender voice calls us, just like it called to Adam and Eve all the way back in the garden. Where are you, son? Where are you, daughter? God knows where we are. He's not asking that question because he's seeking new information he doesn't have. He knows exactly where we are. He's asking where we are at so that we would realize that we've been apart, that we've separated ourselves from God and he wants to restore us. Frankly, Lord, as frustrating, as challenging as this book of Amos has been to preach through, I'm sure, and to hear, what a wonderful piece of good news at the end of it that you will plant us never again to be uprooted, that you will put us back in the garden, that you will restore us. Oh, we're so looking forward to that. Do your work of restoration, Lord. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, when do you want that restoration to happen? Now? Today would be good. <laughs> Frankly, I'm just going to be really honest. Maybe after we've had a chance to watch the Hawks play. <laughs> We're recording it right now. Once the game is over, okay, then, then Lord, come quickly. I don't know when. But Andre Crouch wrote a song called Soon and Very Soon, which kind of expresses this idea. So that's on page 218. Let's stand together and sing Soon and Very Soon. Looking for how God's going to restore us.
Soon, not soon enough, but soon. <laughs> Let's take a moment, we'll sing a doxology, we'll sing our last song, When We All Get to Heaven. get to heaven number 476. God of love, he'll your, fill your heart with peace and send you into the world to live it. And the blessing of God Almighty, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer be with you and those you love today and always. Amen. Amen. We're dismissed, everyone. Amen.